right. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to our wonderful talk on comics. My name, of course, is Chris Poirier. With me, as always, if you listen to the Polis podcast, is the one and only Hexor. And I won't claim that he's French this time, but we're coming here via video, which is weird for us, but we hope to bring more of that awesomeness to all of the folks that love thy nerd and people that listen to the podcast. Pull this podcast in the future. The Polka podcast. The, pol- yes. the Polka. Well, that we weren't going to tell them about the Polka um, <laughs> comic book podcast, but I guess the cat's officially out of the bag. And Hector's been learning Polka for the last six months just so that we could do more um, variety content. But Hector and I want to talk about probably one of the most amazing things in the world. And if you've seen or heard us speak before, we absolutely love comics because we might have only read one or two in our lives. And Hector is only up to seven different devotionals based on pop culture and comics. So he may have some vested interest in the intersection of where faith and comics or faith and fandom. Oh, copyright. Copyright, <laughs> registered, trademarked, et cetera. Um, so I think the one thing that we just want to talk to all of you about in this wonderful time is kind of how we came to where we are in our ministries and why we find comics to be so amazing and so interesting when we talk about that intersection of faith, culture, and comics. So I think just to get us started, I'm kind of going to be our MC so we can let Hector tell us and just bathe us in his brilliance is Hector, kind of what puts you on the path to, to comics can be a tool for reaching people with the gospel. I think the general path, like as a broad run up was that I grew up reading comics. Um, and I had that whole period in my teenage years where I was more interested in girls than comics. Uh-huh. And um, mm-hmm. I sold my comic book collection at a very stupid price to buy flowers and a limo ride for a girl um Aww. so you know there's that but uh in general comics were you know kind of that part of my life for a long time and then i started getting into comic-con culture of visiting large comic cons in my region and um like seeing the passion that was present beyond just the local comic book shops like when you see thirty thousand people in a virtual dungeon underground just really excited about something it's a lot uh easier to tell how big their passion is and Hmm. for me a lot of that was i share passion with them on what the pop culture end but i know that there are in in just a room of thirty thousand people there have to be people who are either a just as passionate about faith as they are about pop culture but they don't know how to express it or connect it or b they're curious about faith but don't have a place they feel comfortable to latch on and learn more or see that they're straight up against it, but could be shown love in that capacity. So that's just one of those things that I saw how passionate our culture is when it comes to pop culture, comics and things of that nature. And that it just seemed like a, a wide open space to be able to share that mutual connection of things we love and maybe either nurture another thing we love or open doors for that. Sure. And I don't know if you've experienced it. I've only experienced it in some cons that I've been to and things, but do you also say that there's probably a certain percentage of folks that unfortunately the church is like, no, that's what children do. And it's been distracting and all those things. It's like, how dare you put your, your superheroes before um, the Lord and all that, that, I know that I've talked to plenty of people that have had that experience of having their, their culture, their, their community, as you just said, kind of, um, Oh, we don't do that here. Uh, It's, it's, it's something I've seen and it's things I've seen in a lot of, and I'm not even saying this to be judgmental in this mindset, but it's usually a lot of people that are self-righteous that usually swing that hard for the fences with that. Um, Faith and fandom almost got born a lot sooner Hmm. Um, Faith and Fandom officially got started in 2013. It almost happened in 2006. Um, the Bible camp that I was a director over, I was the ministry, the director of teen ministries there. Um, we had decided we were going to do a superhero summer. 
and that each cabin was going to be a different comic book location. So Queens, Gotham, Metropolis, et cetera, stuff like that. And that basically we were going to do uh, devotionals and stuff based on each location and that we were going to do these things where we would actually get the local comic book shop. I got our local comic book shop to donate giant standees Ooh. of all the characters and everything to give us posters. I have an X-Men number one poster, like the giant comic book store original print poster that was donated by to our camp. And then we literally had one of the missionaries at the camp be like, that's worldly. <laughs> nope. <laughs> How dare it, you? it was like, literally I'd put in like six months of planning into getting this started and got hit with that. This is a worldly thing. And so we ended up talking about Elijah's like a superhero because, and you know, not that there's anything wrong with that, but like they were so afraid of tapping something that was kind of beginning its stride that uh, they were afraid of that. But that's, that's a, a thing is that, comic books pop culture in general is something that a lot of people are afraid to touch or they draw a very restrictive line around those things of like this is the appropriate world this is the inappropriate world this is for children this is for adults and you know and the same thing that spreads through video games and certain sure. entertainment and other stuff like that Right. I'm sure most of us have experienced in some capacity or another the, oh, that's the thing that we don't talk about here. And I know just as I've gone to different churches on staff that usually during interviews, I'm like, it's okay if I play Dungeons and Dragons, right? I also have tattoos. We should, can, can I just get all this out up front so I can know whether I should spend the next month and a half um, going down this road? So yeah, it's, a journey I think many of us have gone on. It, so it, it is. Go. So I think the thing is for a lot of us is at what point did you begin to see that there is an inherent value within these stories, this specific pop culture medium that it's just started jumping out at you because for anyone that has had the pleasure of picking up any of your um, devotionals you have a very natural eye to these types of things or if they just follow you on social media like your day-to-day -day life is oh that's a thing Pick. um that i'm sure that like many things that's not something unless you know god did just reach out and go hector is my geek and tapped you on the head um how you kind of began that cultivation process of going from point a to point b with this type of material um i just genuinely thought that i i, mean, gr I grew up with the with Christianity and comic books kind of like side by side those were both things I picked up in my teenage years and um I just knew that there's stuff that there's stories that were powerful to me that they were stories that shook me that there were like episodes of Batman the animated series or X-Men the cartoons or stuff growing up that like even as an adult still kind of shake me or you know it's that thing of I, you know, being in middle school, we're about the, we were just talking, we're about the same age bracket. Mm -hmm. I was in elementary or middle school when Superman died. Mm -hmm. And I read comic books then that wasn't like new to me, but all of a sudden it mattered to all the other kids in my class because Superman died. And that was a shared cultural adhesive. And like, it was something that everybody in my like elementary middle school class in that time frame was like Superman died. And that was something they all connected with. And I think that we have this bridge that's already laid. We have this something that these are stories, these are characters that we connect with and that we're passionate about. And one of the things that you see go so poorly um, with, uh, hmm, careful wording, um, <laughs> choose your next words carefully, choose, choose your character. Um, no, sometimes evan evangelism seems hollow mm. because you have no shared connection with the people you're speaking to, um, that they're like, you're just coming at me, shotgunning your message at me. And then skedaddling where when you have a, something that you connect with, it's more like, Hey, we're a little weird here right now. 
and I'm open to hearing more from you and sharing. And um, it's the same thing of like, uh, I was at a conference at New Spring Church, uh, I don't know, five years ago. Um, and I was in a crowd of roughly 7,000 people. Um, just I didn't a know, couple, got it. Yeah, just a couple. I didn't know anyone there, not a soul. And I literally wore my Doctor Who hat as a flag <laughs> to start a conversation with a nerd. Like, if there's a nerd in this building, He's somebody's going to say, yeah. somebody's going to get this and have a conversation with me. And literally, um, we sat down in this conference arena um, about for the thing, but started, and then this young woman turned around and said, I love your hat. And I said, you're a Whovian. Great. Here, I have a Bible study for you. And I literally pulled, uh, I pulled a copy of Faith and Fandom, I think one and two at that point out of my bag and like handed it to her. I was like, hey, these might be an encouragement. And that's literally, I just had them in my bag to give out. But that's the thing. I've that, that one person that I met randomly, we've been friends for five years now um, and connecting with that. And there are people that when you talk about a certain comic book story or you talk about a certain character that you have an automatic connection and an automatic open door to actually not just to not just to be a segue for the gospel, but also to truly be a connecting piece. Like when there aren't that many people that like the question, but when you see somebody else, you know, I have a friend that changed their profile picture to the question. And I'm like, I didn't know you blah, blah. You know, we had a whole conversation about it or, you know, different connections to me. You're a big Rorschach fan. I um, mean, yeah. it's just like when you see somebody else share a passion, it's almost like an invitation to get, draw closer. And, and I think that's a big deal. And to be completely honest, literally two hours ago at the comic book store this morning, a uh, dude rolled in with nothing but Watchmen tattoos on both arms. Um, had, you know, a Dr. Manhattan in the black and white, a Rorschach in a black and white, and then Manhattan walking through the atomizer being, you know, that yeah, 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 iconic scene of the Ooh, skeleton and just like that, being blown out. That was, was a tattoo. Bl- yeah, it was black and white, and I was like, "Well oh, done, sir." That's and, sick. And showed him mine, and he's like, "There's not a lot of dudes that put that have Watchmen tattoos." I'm like, "No, that's why I normally notice them while I'm out and about." Um, so, right, it's like you said that shared experience generally, I think, is an underpinning that we simply come to the realization as Christians that. God created us, knitted us together literally for the sake of community, for wanting to be around one another, which is why COVID-19 sucks. It sucks that, yeah, that Hector and I are talking through a video screen today instead of- You moved away anyway. (sighs) Oh, wow. This is is where we're going to have this conversation. Sorry, love that nerd. You get to watch Chris and Hector work some stuff out for the next 30 minutes. You abandoned me. it'll (laughs) It'll be interesting, we swear. But no, but- Community is so, so important. And yes, I abandoned Hector and I apologize. The plane of church, whatever. It's, you know. Yeah, fine. Advancing the kingdom, doing nerdy things. How dare you? Um, that, yeah, that shared experience comes to a lot of stuff. And what's always been super fascinating to me, and we'll kind of share it for um, LTN Talk Part 2, because we're going to focus primarily on that cultural experience and why comics are so important to overlaying the faith story and the realities of the gospel in this one. But the next one's going to be the practicality of how we go about that is I met Hector at a con and you know, the rest is history as they say that I walked up to his table and went, wait, there, there is an intersection between faith and all this stuff. And there was Hector smiling at me and was like, buy my shirt. And I did. And now we talk about faith and comics and stuff on the interwebs for, for funsies and, to also hopefully reach folks that you're not alone in this strange journey of comics and faith and all that. So I think some of the importance for today's talk as we've kind of been getting around is there's lots of different things that get us to um, the venue, if you will, for the conversation. But for you personally, Hector, um, as you kind of started forming these devotional type things is what really started jumping in your brain as you were reading comics that made you go, Hey, wait a second. I've heard this before or something similar and kind of what's that thought process work out for you? How does the mind of Hector function as you're starting to show the intersection of these two things? Well, one of the, 
great things about comic books, especially like, you know, that we're really starting to show appreciation for is the fact that we've got roughly a uh, 80 year track record of yeah, only 80 years. Nothing. Yeah. No, no biggie. <laughs> we've got like an 80 year track record of continual stories weekly um, of 80 years of stories being told over and over again. And when stories are being told in that fashion, you get a picture of a, the heart of artists and creators Mm -hmm. in their time period. But you also get a collection of how they view the world and what the world is interested in, what the world feeds on. And you can see through what's being, what stories are being told in comic books now where the world is. It's almost like the folklore of modern times. Um, And with that, there's always been, you know, you know, the whole thing out of Ecclesiastes, there's nothing new under the sun. Right. The, these stories of redemption, these stories of hope, these stories of betrayal, of forgiveness, of bitterness, of redemption, all these stories that we read in comics are stories that echo through scripture. And that if you are interested in the story of someone sacrificially you know, redeeming of people. You can find that in both if you're interested in those things. And so it's easy to see that like when you're reading these stories of heroics, because I think one of the reasons we're drawn to comics so deeply is because we want, we want heroics. We want stories that tell us that we can be better than what we are. We want to see good overcoming evil. Cause I mean, think about comics going on during like world war two, right? We wanted to see evil, be vanquished and we wanted to see heroes rise up let's look right at the beginning i think one of the best stories that's the easiest to talk from is literally the creation of superman Mm -hmm. that we have two um jewish creators um in 1938 so even before u.s involvement in the war looking across the world seeing and hearing things from their family seeing what's unfolding while the united states is still figuring out what they're seeing And they get together and want to create an image of something that gives them hope and humanity. And that comes in the passage of an alien that gets adopted by literally some middle American normal folks for the time that then has literally the power of everything within them. But at the same time, it's still kind of like a normal dude, right? You know, Clark puts on his glasses and somehow forgets how to write and use the English language, apparently. Um, but we took off my glasses and I forgot the ability to see. Right. He's like, what? <laughs> um, that that's the starting point. And most amazing for us is a lot of pastors and a lot of Christians always do the, oh, the Christology of Superman. I was like, hold up. I'll let me back you up. <laughs> I said, two Jewish dudes created Superman. But for there's... Them, yeah, there's still plenty of parallels, but for them, they actually were holding up a Moses type archetype. They were looking for the person that was going to guide them into the next thing. But just look at over time as Superman, 80 plus years of existence, multiple creators that we can see the same type of hope and images that we go from Old Testament to New Testament super quick in literally just the creation of one guy that literally two folks that um, Simon and Schuster were small dudes, like physically and otherwise. And they still found a way to tell a story, make it interesting, and then still go and fight a war and, and come back. And Captain America was exactly the same thing happening literally a couple blocks from Simon and Schuster in Manhattan. Some other young dudes were sitting down going, we need something that we can look to and see the good in the world right now where it looks like there's so much darkness and then boom, 80 years later, we know who the first Avenger was, right? Yeah. Who here didn't know that (laughs) pack up your stuff and walk out quietly. We're not judging you too much, but (laughs) I try to push up my glasses when I'm not wearing. Yeah. Um, But one of the other things too, about the Superman story, we we always hit that part, but one of the things, and I didn't learn this until I read Brad Meltzer's um, the, the book of lies. Oh, yes. Um, That one of the reasons Superman was created the way he was, that he was a bulletproof human, was the fact that one of their fathers was gunned down Mm -hmm. and the killer was never found. Right. So the idea of a bulletproof man that fought for that fought against injustice was honestly like basically a wounded child 
saying this is what I wish my dad was or going through that. So, I mean, it's just, there's always going to be elements of these stories we connect with. And like, for me, um, I'm, I'm a pastor. That's my like day job, but I, I fully admit I am not the best human all the times. And I make, (laughs) I I make mistakes and I'm sinful and I do all these things. And there was a story and, you know, I, I mentioned this one a lot, but it was a Tom King's two issue story called the eternal vow. That was a Batman and Wonder Woman trapped and it's a struggle of their integrity. Yes. And literally, I don't know of another issue Uh, like a single small story in comics that has challenged me as a man, as a pastor, as a husband, as a father to have better integrity than that one story. And whenever I'm telling people about, you know, Batman stories or any comics that changed my life, like this simple two issue story that like called me out to have better integrity. That's a big deal. And I think that's one of the things is you've got an, a, a virtually endless catalog of stories that echoes things we go through. And I think that's an open door. And, you know, the fact that it's gone on to be that the stories we, that were in print usually went to cartoons or TV and now they are the biggest move money makers in the world. Right. Outside of star Wars. But you know, that's a, another fun line. Um, but they're the biggest stories in the world where when I was growing up in middle school, I got picked on for checking comic books out of the library versus now like you're weird. If you don't go see the new Marvel movie, Uh, it's like, it's the thing we've gone from it just being an underlying part of our culture to it actually being a staple of everyone's culture. Like it's, it's, it's something that's the connective tissue in entertainment. And I think that, I can echo off from that because, again, it's a piece that will kind of get to the practical, but I want to use it as an illustration that during my last year at the comic shop as a manager, I started book club and I had a bunch of church people be like, why on earth are you starting a book club? You should be starting a Bible study and how dare you and all that good stuff. And I'm like, hold up, fam. Um, Everything we just talked about for the last 10 minutes is the setup to the rest of this story. And that if I call it a comic book club, a bunch of people are going to show up because what do you do at book clubs? You read the thing and you talk about how it impacted you personally or how you found certain themes, et cetera, interesting to your life, right? Because we've all experienced life differently, had different things happen in our life. And we usually look to entertainment mediums to either reminisce about certain things or to look at something that we've experienced differently or to go, yeah, that was really difficult thing I did in my life or happened to me. And in a book club, I had literally, I brought a couple of my Christian friends with me and that's a good thing to do. And we'll talk about that in part two. Um, But I also had everyone else from the shop. So we had members of the LGBTQ community present and we just set up front. We're like, Hey, we're going to talk about life in here, which means a lot of stuff's going to come up. So everybody can agree that we're going to be cool. Right. That, you know, acknowledge that people experience life differently and that that happened to you. So that's a valid discussion. Right. And we started dropping books and that was the thing that everyone came up with was, These are the, these stories tell about life or difficult pieces of life. And now you get the opportunity to talk about why that matters to you or what type of impact that has to you. So for a lot of us Christian nerds, we can get straight to the gospel from stories of revenge, from stories of redemption, from stories of hope that that's where our community, I feel like got lost for a few decades where they were like, nope, nope, don't read those nasty comics. And it's like, but those nasty comics are literally a mirror of the world that they're present in. We always need a scapegoat to actually put us off from having to deal with self-discipline and holiness. Right. And also the realities of that bad stuff happens. Mm -hmm. Um, And that a lot of those things are the sin realities that are in front of us. But deep down in a lot of those stories is still a hero that's trying to punch back the darkness or to figure out why maybe revenge isn't the way I was like, Batman's going on an 80 year, pretty difficult trip on figuring out that holding the grudge of his parents being murdered in front of him is kind of a thing in his life impacted him just a little. That's why we needed Robert Pattinson to say I'm acceptance. (laughs) (laughs) It's not wrong. (laughs) Um, But 
we constantly see creators throughout the years dealing with those types of, of questions and the morality of even superheroes. Because if you have the ability to be a superhero um, that either has superhuman attributes or you're Tony Stark and Bruce Wayne and can throw money at each other until, you know, things happen. Um, and Peter Parker just got bit by a radioactive spider, you know, right place, right time, I guess. Unless you're Daredevil, then you got hit by a truck full of radioactive stuff and became blind for the rest of your life. So I guess it depends on how you look at that. Um, but no matter how insane the stories are, there's some element grounded in reality that I think is where we kind of make that connective tissue, like you said, and why community is so important for the comics folks. So I guess, Hector, as we kind of weave our way to the finish line for part one is what do you think is really important or tips for folks to be able to look at an artistic medium and find, um, find elements of the gospel um, present. Is, is that the process or is it the other way around? Um, for me, uh, I, I always point to a uh, first Corinthians nine twenty two. It's the, uh, the whole thing of where Paul said to the weak, I become weak to the strong. I become strong. It's mm -hmm. like that we are going to be able to find connectivity with the stuff that we're passionate about, the stuff that other people identify with. So as we're getting into like the next chunk, that that's kind of the scripture that I, you know, I'd say has that attitude, that heart. But the other thing is it's the simple thing of where, you know, Jesus said, if you seek, you will find. If you go into pop culture looking for spiritual themes, you'll find them. If you go into uh, scripture looking for things that connect to what goes on in your everyday life, you'll find it. One of the problems is people read scripture as something to check off or right. read it as history instead of how does this actually apply to what I'm seeing, what I'm going through and stuff like that. So if you're, if you're honestly going into what you read, what you watch, what you're entertaining, then it's something you're going to train your mind to. Um, my kids, I have a 12 year old, a 10 year old and a seven year old. And um, they know that when we come along something spiritual in a pop culture medium of any kind, that I'm going to run and grab this laptop and uh, screenshot stuff and make memes. Um, because so many memes. So many memes. Um, but, but with that being said, like, I don't tell my kids, hey, when we watch this, you be ready to stop when I see it. Like, they, they don't know it. Like, it's to the point now that my 12-year-old, when she hears something that has biblical relevance, she doesn't even look at me. She just pauses it. <laughs> Um, because okay. that she's trained her mind. She's like, mm, that's something dad will use, or that has a good spiritual thing. That's like this. Like, so she has trained her mind to look for biblical relevance in our pop culture. Like, I think we were watching the Downton Abbey movie or something recently. She's like, Boop, you need this for this. And like, whatever <laughs> else from, so from star Wars to Downton Abbey to avatar, to all the different things. It's the, and even when we read comics, because when I read, get comics each week you know i'll tell her these are appropriate for you come back and talk to me and she's like did you see this panel and like but it's the thing if if you honestly go into looking for the spirit of god the presence of god the themes of god through your entertainment you'll find it um but it's not like it's going to force you he's not like he's going to force you to see it otherwise you know it's it's the difference of if you go into a grocery store looking for off brands you know you'll find them if you look for them otherwise they just kind of all blend in uh so it's it's honestly a lot about your perception about what you're looking for do you have any advice for anyone in terms of how to think that way or to process is is there a habit that you've found that is really helpful in seeking God in those places or has it truly been the issue of we make sure that as good Christian practice getting time in the word is obviously one of the most important things that we can do to build our ourselves up um, so are you diving into comics like straight after your study time and that helps or, you know, um, I'm trying to think of, let's give, let's give a little bit of a tidbit on that practical, on that practical application piece 
as so so I'm I'm gonna I, I I'm just making this up right now. This sure. is sure. This is an LTN con exclusive, but I will use this for the rest of my life because I think it's Registered, a dope idea. Copyrighted, trademarked. Patented. I can make an R gang Pat, signs. Patent, um, patent pending. So I'm going to do, this is what I'm going to call the Mark Shepard effect. Ooh. If you're familiar with Mark Shepard, uh, he is the short bearded British little man that's in all pop culture. Um, <laughs> He's in Doom Patrol, Supernatural, Firefly, Doctor Who, Battlestar Galactica. Um, like, uh, he's literally in everything um, pop culture related. And that's the thing. Um, when you see Mark Shepard in one thing, it's easy to point out, oh, hey, I just saw him in this. They're connected in some way. Um, if you aren't actually reading scripture, and putting that into your life, you're not going to recognize it when you see it out there. Mm. So if all you're taking in is what you hear in a sermon on a Sunday, you're probably not going to have enough intake to be able to see it outside. But if, if you eat, it's the whole idea of what goes into you is what you're going to have the most recognition with. So if you're, putting scripture in you on a daily basis, you'll see where scripture applies to you in and out. Um, if you're in, so that's, that's one of the biggest things I'd say is the, you need to be able to actually see it here so you can recognize it there um, and keep it fresh in our, but like, it's not like I jump from comics to Bible study and it's, that's rarely that right. it's that um, I've, I've done that whole thing, you know, out of, you know, what Psalms are said, I hid your word in my heart. Um, that I can, I'm one of those guys and I get, it, I'm a pastor. That's my job. But like, I, I can look at any remote situation usually and say, that's this reference. Um, if somebody brings a scripture off top, but this is the deal. That's not just relegated to pastors or full-time ministers. That's if you put enough scripture in you, you'll see it in the world around you. And I, I think that's one of the biggest things is to have scripture going into your life and then have a mindset to actually see where the themes of God are present through what you see and what you read. That's great. And I think as we've kind of discussed here and as many people that just the nerds that they are, we all have our different fandoms. We all have our different geekiness and stuff. So we absorb a ton of content um, pretty much constantly and I think that's kind of the intersection. It's why faith and fandom exist. It's why love thy nerd exists that we all have those things that are, we're super passionate about. And this is then the beginning of the intersection quite literally of those two things, because if we have that solid grounding in scripture and the realities of the gospel, then it means we can speak. We have a relevance to speak into culture and that, arts for everybody to observe and take in and interpret. And though, trust me, plenty of creators will take great personal offense when you interpret it differently than they intended it. Tr the true beauty of all art is the fact that technically interpretation is part of the process and the enjoyment of the thing. So we hope that at least some of you are inspired by the realities of if we remain grounded well in the truth of scripture, then we can continue to show those wonderful parallels in the world around us and to hopefully draw others into conversation where they wouldn't have thought conversation is. So Hector and I want to thank you for kind of this first part of our conversation on comics and culture in general, but come back for part two, uh, the sequel. And we're going to talk a little more about that practical application as to, okay, so I get it now. I can see the gospel in culture around me. So now what do I do with that message and with the stuff that's around us? So don't miss it. Come back for part two. We'll see you there. Look, look, look.